So hello everyone. I hope you are enjoying this event. I hope the, the lunch was good. So um, I'm here to talk about a lot of things. And one of the things is that I suck at naming presentations. But what I really want to talk about is how we can use the concept of clean architecture in a white label environment. And we're, I'm going to use our application at Ibankit as a case study. So to give you a little context, uh, in the banking environment, every bank has their own system, the way they manage data. So at eBankit, we provide a framework that abstracts many kinds of services and APIs and provides it in a common middleware where our apps from mobile to internet banking to smartwatch banking can consume that data. But we, all have, we already have a solution, but we still have challenges. So we decided to start over and design a new architecture. So what are the challenges we, we face? So this is a white label application. A bank comes as a client, gives us some requirements, and we have to produce a product for them. So since every bank has their way of doing stuff, the requirement, requirements and design can change from client to client. But most of the business logic is common to all the clients, and we should be able to reuse it. We should not repeat ourselves. Also, we should be able to accommodate any extra things the bank can have. And on top of that, we should be able to add new features regularly and quickly. So our solution will have to be modular in the sense that when a team is assigned to a client, they, they only use the components they need in the system. So adding new features to the system should be really easy and quick. And like I said, there's common business logic and that logic should, should be identified and isolated so that it can be reused. It should be really flexible. You could play around with stuff if you should be able to create, create your own flows. And it's 2019, I shouldn't be telling you this, but it should be testable. So after looking around for solutions, we turn to the good old clean architecture. So most of you in the Android community should be familiar with it. It's not a, a new concept. For those of you who don't know what is clean architecture, clean architecture is basically a way to um, separating your software into layers so you can create a system that is intrinsically testable with a clear separation of concerns and where you can replace easily elements that are external to the core logic of your software. With all due respect to Robert Martin, the creator of this architecture, I think this di diagram is a little bit hard to understand. So I'd rather put it this way. So to the left, you have the presentation layer. This is common to most architectures. This is the basic stuff. It can be whatever design pattern you choose from MVP to MVVM, MVC. In the center of the, this architecture, you have your domain. The domain layer is what describes our, what your application really does. It contains the business logic and the data models that represent the data you want to show to the user. And you have your data layer that could be web APIs, it could be a local storage, the Android framework, whatever. This layer contains concrete implementations. And this architecture also proposes a dependency rule in the sense that the layers to the left should depend on the layers to the right. I think it makes sense to us that the, the data layer should not depend on the presentation layer. You cannot test an architecture like that. So moving forward, this is another way to put it. Clean architecture comes with a concept which is called use cases. Use cases are pieces of logic that execute a certain use case of your system. They describe a feature that your system wants to do. In this, it, it's contained in the domain layer. It uses the business logic and outputs data models. It uses abstractions from the data layer and it provides models to the presentation layer. 
So let's talk about data. So typically, when you ask for data, you, you call for your data to, to your server, you either get it or you don't get it. So normally we handle data with callbacks. So we, we call our repository, we pass a callback and we say when it's ready, when it's successful, successful call this function. When it's not successful, call another function. Well, as most of you know, debugging software based on callbacks can lead you here. You can end up in callback hell, burning inside. But what if there was another way we, we could express this concept? So why not wrap our data in a type safe way that we could represent in a variable, either success or error? So Kotlin has this concept called sealed class. A sealed class is like an enum in a way that it represents a um, closed hierarchy of classes. But contrary to enums, the data classes inside a sealed class can have different constructors. So you can represent states. So in this case, we can model our system to use sealed classes. As you can see, we can get an output from the data sources without any callback, it's just a variable. And then we can check if it was successful or there was an error. This creates kind of a unidirectional flow of data through your application. So when we talk about data, we have to talk about concurrency. So in the ideal world, you would call for data. We, you would get it right away, but you know it's not like that. And you cannot block your main thread. You, you have to still allow the user to interact with your application while lo lo loading the data. So in Android, we have a few solutions. We have async tasks, which was the go-to solution back in the day. Everyone that worked with async tests knows it's a, a bit clunky. It has some problems. We have thread, the good old Java threading API with thread pools, executors, futures, and promises. We have event buzz. It was a popular solution back in the day. It's based on publisher subscriber pattern. And the most common one nowadays, which, which is RxJava. RxJava is a reactive library built on top of the uh, Thurible pattern that comes with a lot of um, functional stuff that you can use to manipulate your data. But there's another option. Kotlin has this thing called coroutines. It's nothing new, it's been around a while, but Kotlin has its implementation. It's been out of experimental for some time and it's the new cool kid in the block. So, what are coroutines? So coroutines basically are like lightweight threads in the sense that when you create a thread, it takes like one megabyte of memory. You want to create a coroutine, it takes like 10K of memory. So it's really lightweight. You can launch like 10,000, 100,000, and your application will still perform. They come, with uh, they come with Kotlin. You don't need any extra library to use them. They provide a concept which is called structured concurrency. And the best part of it, they allow you to write asynchronous code in a way that feels and looks sequential. So I will explain a little bit about coroutines. It's a, a really deep topic. So if you want to know about more about coroutines, I'll leave a link at the end. So at the heart of coroutines is a concept called suspending functions. Suspending functions are functions that can be started, paused, and resumed whenever you want. They are implemented using a continuation passing style. So whenever you write the suspend keyword, it gets translated to that method signature. And there's a continuation object that gets passed around and contains the state of your suspending function. So how do you use coroutines? So coroutines have a scope. You can have your global scope, which is uh, application-wide. It's tied to the application lifecycle. And then you have localized scopes. 
So to create a coroutine, a coroutine, you need something called a coroutine builder. You have three different ones. You have launch. This is kind of fire and forget. You launch a coroutine, and you get a reference to it as a job object. You can use that job object to cancel the coroutine if you need. You have the async builder. The async builder is meant for parallel execution. So when you launch a coroutine with uh, the async builder, you will get a deferred object. This is really similar to futures and promises in the sense that it's a representation of the data that will eventually be there. And you have run blocking, which is like running sequential code. It blocks the current thread until the execution is done. It returns some data. So with coroutines come some dispatchers so that you can express to the coroutines framework how you want to schedule the execution of stuff. You have the default dispatcher. This uses a shared thread pool on the JVM. You have the IO dispatchers, which is um, you can only run one operation at a time. And it's meant for network and uh, IO. And you have the main dispatcher. The main dispatcher in Android refers to the main thread, the UI thread. So like I said, coroutines provide a concept called structured, con structured concurrency. So when you launch a coroutine, you can launch more coroutines inside of that one. And they will have um, a parent-child relationship. So in this case, you can see that I'm launching a coroutine and I'm launching two async coroutines inside. And when I cancel the parent job, it cancels everything that it spawned. So in an Android application, this is really useful because we need to be aware of the life cycle of the UI we are showing. And we need to, for example, you're on a screen, you change the screen, you need to cancel all the tasks that were there. So here's an example of how, how you can use it. I'm using view model. So you just extend the coroutine scope, you define your context, and when the life cycle event is fired, you simply call cancel on your coroutine context. All the coroutines that were launched within this context will be canceled. So moving forward into architecture, I want to talk about the use case interactive. So th this is the heart of your application. This is what executes the business logic. This contains the implementation details. This should be able to use abstractions so that you can replace, for example, if your database implementation gets outdated, you should be able to replace it easily so that our interactive can use it. So in the clean architecture, the concept of use case describes a feature. And a feature can be complex, can have uh, many parts to it, so we decided why not get a bit granular on it so that we can, when implementing a feature, we can use little features and combine them. So this is our use case. Uh, the flow is simple. First, we validate the input. If it's valid, we execute the logic we have to execute. If it's not, we just output an error. We are using our use case interactors are meant to be used like suspending functions. They are little bits of code that will run inside a coroutine context. So let's talk about our data sources in the architecture. So we have our remote data, and like I said, we have a middleware that exposes a plethora of services of the, the client we're implementing on. But this can get monolithic. A bank can have like 100 endpoints for data. So we decided to split them up into little pieces. In this example, I'm showing the customer service, which only contains methods that are related to stuff about the customer. And normally, in clean architecture, we use the repository pattern, which is an abstraction on the data layer. But in our case, we decided not to use it because we don't have a one-to-one -one match on 
the remote entities and where, what we store locally. So, like I said, we need to be able to extend our middleware. So here, this is, an ex this is the base implementation of our EventKit service, which contains the core logic of the service. Uh, we're using retrofit, so basically the way you, you use it, it's like this. You define your retrofit interface, which contain, contains the, the methods you can call on your API, and then you simply call execute request and you say, I want to execute the re request on this endpoint. So our base service contains all the logic about uh, common error handling, data mapping. So this is what the interactor sees. The interactor simply calls a list of products. So let's move on to an example. This is one of the, the, the features we have. We can, we let our user list all the products they currently own at the bank, either accounts, loans, deposits, credit cards. So first we need to, to fetch the customer products from the API. Then we get some user data from the local storage. We filter the products we got from the API using some data we fetch from the storage, and we display the results. So this, this is the, the actual business logic of this feature. So what does it look like architecturally? So in this example, I'm using uh, view model arch architectural component. You can use whatever, it's not dependent on that. So as you can see, the, the central point is the get products interactor, which uses the customer service to get the um, products list and the user data store to get the, um, the user information it needs. So in this example, how does the interactor look like? So like I said, when we model all data using sales classes, we can have the result of this operation in a simple variable, in products result in this example. So this is running inside the context of a coroutine, like I said, it's meant to run in that, it's a, it's a suspending function. So when you call for get products list, eventually you'll get the result. And then we see, is this result successful? If it was, we get the user data we need from the local store. And then if that was successful, we apply the logic we need to apply. So how does the, the, the view model look like in this example? So in the view model, you simply call your get products interactor, you pass an input, and you wait for the output. In this example, I'm modeling the state of the view using uh, a sealed class as well. So how would it look like in the view? Well, the view would only have to subscribe for changes in its state. So the view really becomes dumb. So this is pretty cool, but this still kind of sucks. We can do better and this is Kotlin, we want to make things a bit more functional and composable, so why not create some extension functions on it? So we did. Here's an, an example of an extension function you can create on it. So that, that you can abstract some of the boilerplate logic you had in the previous solution. So this way, the way you describe your system becomes more fluent but we can do even better. We can create the abstract uh, extension functions on our use case interactor. And the end result we are trying to achieve at the moment is to create a fluent way to combine those little use case interactors to create more, compli more complex use cases where you can swap them around like Legos. So, to conclude, um, you can see that clean architecture principles are really helpful when uh, dealing with, I um, want to know more about the stuff I talked, so any questions? Any questions?
impressions? Still digesting all that clean architecture? Um, no. Nothing. So, oh, in that case, I can rush. I can rush some stuff. So, if you want to know more about the stuff I talk, anything. Right. So, just a quick question for me. So, are you implementing this currently? Yes, we are. We currently have a solution already implemented. In so all the projects already use this quintual base we're working on. We plan to expand from here. Okay. Um, yep. So thank you so to uh, our next speaker. So uh, thank you once again. Um, so next we have. Uh,